Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Kate Kelly and Brandon Wolf to discuss ordinary equality, the fearless women and queer people who shaped the U.S. Constitution and the Equal Rights Amendment, published by our friends at Gibbs Smith. Kay Kelly is a feminist, activist, and human rights lawyer. She holds a JD degree from American University, Washington College of Law, the only law school in the country founded by and for women. She's a nationally known advocate for the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment and host and creator of the podcast, Ordinary Equality. To moderate tonight's conversation, we are also joined by Brandon Wolf, a nationally recognized advocate for LGBTQ issues and gun violence prevention. Brandon found his passion for social change following the shooting at Pulse Nightclub. He is a frequent contributor on state and national media outlets, having published opinion columns in USA Today, CNN Digital, and Orlando Weekly. He has brought awareness to the issues in HuffPost, Metro Weekly, and on television outlets such as MSNBC, CNN, and more. Brandon received the Voice for Equality Award at the 2018 Orlando Gala. In his free time, Brandon volunteers with the Drew Project, an organization he founded following the shooting at Pulse Nightclub that sponsors LGBTQ student groups and provides college funding to future leaders. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen, and please order your copy of Ordinary Equality from Books and Books Below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hey there, how are you? Hey. Hi, everybody. Hi, Kate. How are you doing? Hi, so good. So thrilled to be here with you. Oh, I'm <laughs> thrilled to be here with you, too. It's been so long since we've been together, so it's nice. Uh, even if it is virtually, it's, it's nice to be together. Um, I'm loving your shirt, by the way. Whoa, I, feel like, I feel like I need to get one of those. Uh, oh, for yeah. engagement. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. A friend of mine uh, made them. She hand screen prints them. Feminist, feminist owned business. So <laughs> that's amazing. Well, it's great to see you. And I know I'm super excited to, to have a conversation about your new book uh, and where it fits in the landscape, why it's so important right now. Um, but before we get too far down that rabbit hole, I wonder if you could just give us some context and perspective. What is ordinary equality? Um, what kind of perspective is it bringing into the conversation right now? Yeah, thank you again so much for being here and for doing the work that you do. Uh, I know it's not easy and it's not easy to be in Florida right now and it's not easy to be any place as a queer person uh, doing policy work. So thank you for what you do. Uh, I'm from Utah. I'm from a very, what we like to call low human rights infrastructure state. Uh, and so <laughs> yeah, living it, living it. Um, so I just really appreciate you being here and taking the time and doing what you do. And everyone else should get very excited for Brandon's book upcoming, forthcoming, uh, uh, tentatively titled Safe Space. It's going to be amazing. And I'm just Thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to hear that you're also writing a book, um, which is a wild journey. Um, a wild journey. <laughs> we could have a whole conversation okay. about the journey of writing a book for sure. If anyone has any questions about the process, I'm happy to dish. Um, but I wanted to start out by just saying there are, um, from the very beginning of our country, false stories and narratives about the people who were left out of our foundational documents. And the false narrative, or as some would call fake news, uh, that we have been fed about the US Constitution is that that's just the way it was at the time. This was the environment these framers were operating in, and they just did what was expected of them at the time. These white landowning men excluded everyone except for themselves and people like them. So when they say by the people for the people, who is the people? <laughs> the people was, did not include women of any race, did not include enslaved people, did not include native people, 
um, and did not include any people of color uh, or any, uh, any other marginalized groups. And this was by design. So in writing this book, I wanted to help people understand that where we are now is the logical conclusion and exact design of the people who, who wrote it, the people who, who started this country. And women at the time were advocating to be included. Mm. So it's not like they didn't think about it or it never crossed their minds or they didn't know any women or, you know, <laughs> they knew that women wanted to be included. One of the chapters in the book is about Abigail Adams, uh, who was wife of John Adams, who became the president. And at the time that he was at the Constitutional Convention, she was writing him letters daily uh, saying, you know, they often exchanged letters about policy issues. When she, when he became president, she went by the title Mrs. Presidentress. Oh, uh, I'm gonna hold on to that actually. Oh yeah, she was like very into it. She was into her role, um, and and so as and and some people include her as one of the framers of the Constitution because her intellectual property was so involved in all these letters that she was writing to him. But one of the letters she wrote him uh, is kind of famous, and it says, "Remember the ladies." But in this letter, that's the that's the part that's quoted. But this letter was like scathing. It was like, we refuse to be governed by a system that does not include us. We will foment a rebellion. Um, you know, it was this like scathing, very, very um, rebellious letter that she wrote. And so men at the time were being lobbied by women at the time to be included in this document. And so it was an intentional choice that they made to exclude us. Wow. And so all of the consequences that we're suffering today and the rollback of rights and LGBTQ rights and, and all of the issues that we're, that we're suffering really stem back to this original moment where they intentionally left out women. Um, and at the time, they wouldn't have said queer people, but also queer people uh, were very intentionally excluded. And so the book is sort of a uh, it, it's it's about the Constitution, but it's not legal. I think people, I'm also a lawyer, uh, <laughs> and so people will be surprised that the book, I keep looking over here because I have it, but the book is fully illustrated. Um, it has uh, lots of charts and graphs. Um, and I think for me, the point was to help people with no context, no law degree, no, no you know, experience with the issue, understand it and see themselves in these stories of women and queer people um, and, and see ourselves as constitution makers all along trying to influence the process. And when you think about the founding fathers or, or the people who wrote the constitution, you think of white men in wigs, in a room, all in suits. Right. <laughs> like that's the image we all have. So I'm trying to repaint a picture of who 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 framers of the constitution are who who the the founding mothers of our of our nation are um and i'm trying to recreate a visual picture that has always included queer people um people of color specifically black women who have been advocating to get us in mm. that's so important um first of all thank you for for helping to paint that picture and quite literally painting a picture because i know uh, I told somebody that I was reading, um, oh my gosh, The Deficit Myth. I don't know if you've read The Deficit Myth, which is a book on modern monetary theory. Um, mm -hmm. And I could see their eyes glazing over as soon as I started talking. I'm like super nerdy about it. I'm a policy guy. So I was like excited and I could see them like, I, I don't get what you're talking about. So I do think it's so important that, that the way you framed it is like, you know, this belongs to all of us, which means we have to tell it in a way that belongs to all of us. It can't feel exclusionary. That's sort of part of the, the design of the process, right? Is that it feels complicated and uh, and clunky and people don't feel connected to the process. And, and um, that continues to leave them out as we have these conversations. And so I wonder if um, you, you sort of zeroed in on this LGBTQ component of you know, the book and the stories that you've told. I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about that because, you know, I'm thinking about the founding of this country and I'm having a hard time imagining queer people 
as like a part of the foundation of the nation. I, I obviously I know queer people were there. Uh, queer people have always been there. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, where do queer people fit in there and why is it so important that they're in this book? Yeah, I mean, our lives as queer people have always been intentionally erased, um, but as you know, and as you said, we've we've always been there. <laughs> um, when I think about the founding fathers specifically, um, something about that I write about in the book is actually a lot of them used marriage to improve their station. So uh, marriages at the time, or at least a lot of their marriages, were not about love. They were not about what we would think of as a modern concept of marriage. Uh, what they did is marry wealthy women with a large inheritance because women's uh, political identity and ability to inherit money was completely erased when they got married. So who knows the sexual orientation of a lot of these men because what they were doing was marrying for money <laughs> in almost every case. Um, and so they would inherit the, the, you know, they would marry up, they would marry these women um, who weren't allowed to inherit their own property. Like once they married, the men got everything. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, uh, you know, I talk about the suffrage era um, when we, women were, women and queer people were battling for the 19th amendment to get the constitutional right to vote. A lot of those women were lesbians uh, and queer who rose to the highest ranks of the suffrage movement for some pretty, you know, straightforward reasons. If you married, you lost your legal identity, you mm. lost your ability to travel, you lost your ability to inherit, you lost, um, once you started having children, you had additional responsibilities of full-time caregiving. So women, married women who had children at the time could not dedicate what it took to the movement to be the leaders of the suffrage movement. It had to be queer women. Mm. Uh, and so almost all of the major leaders of the suffrage movement were queer, uh, including like, you know, people know about Susan B. Anthony. Susan B. Anthony never married. Susan B. Anthony dedicated her life to women. Susan B. Anthony specifically had a partner. Um, Carrie Chapman Cat. Carrie Chapman Cat had a part, uh, one female partner, uh, I think it was for 30 years. They they were buried side by side in, in uh, communal headstones. Uh, they were just like straight up lesbians, <laughs> like stone cold <laughs> like lesbians. Um, the same is true of, of Alice Paul, uh, who wrote the Equal Rights Amendment is credited with being, you know, its longtime uh, proponent. Alice Paul never married. Uh, never had any uh, serious suitors that were male, said she dedicated her life to women, uh, I, in my opinion, was dating Lucy Burns, another suffragist uh, mm -hmm. who had like fiery red hair and was this amazing, uh, amazing character in the suffrage movement. So even in the suffrage movement, though a lot of this history has been erased, many of these women were queer secretly or just straight up, like had partners, lived with them, owned property together and were buried together. Yeah. Um, so I try to resurrect that history um, because it's so important. You know, some of the parts of the book that various editors tried to cut out, not because it was not interesting, but just for length, they're like, okay, we got to, we got to tone it down here, you know, or cut length, uh, which is the least fun part of the process. No, I'm not looking forward to that. <laughs> oh gosh, no, killing your darlings is very hard. Um, but one of the the things they tried to, like, I talked a lot about Barbara, uh, one of the chapters is about Barbara Jordan. Barbara Jordan was the first black woman uh, from the South elected to Congress ever. Barbara Jordan uh, had an incredibly illustrious career as a lawmaker uh, and had a partner for, for decades uh, that she, she lived with and um, was her romantic partner, known to her family and intimate friends, but not publicly. So uh, it was not public. She was a very public figure. She spoke at you know, the, the DNC, she was like out, she was very, very well known at the time involved in the Nixon hearings, but no one knew that she was a lesbian until she died. Mm. Um, it was at her funeral that her partner came forward and sat with the family. And that was the first time that they publicly acknowledged that she was a lesbian. Um, and so these stories are so important um, for us to see that not only have we always been there, um, but the reason you don't hear about us is because we've been systematically and intentionally erased. Um, and so I want I want people to see 
younger people particularly, I want them to see that we've always been there. We've always been policy nerds. We're not just in the arts. Uh, we're also in law and making law, enforcing law and changing law. Um, and, and because queer people are, if I do say so myself, some of the brightest, uh, you know, most passionate uh, leaders in all of the social movements, in every movement for social justice, justice, we've been at the forefront. And I, I think it's really time that we reclaimed our place. And then I'll say the last thing, and if folks have more questions about this, um, I can talk more about it, but it's also important to know who was the proponents of the ERA um, and constitutional equality so that we know why it's so important for us today. Yeah. A lot of people that would be surprised to hear uh, that the word women is actually not in the Equal Rights Amendment. It's nowhere in the text. Uh, it specifically says on the basis of sex. And, you know, it was written in, it first introduced in 1923. <laughs> so they weren't envisioning this at the time, uh, but the language uh, thankfully was modeled after the 19th Amendment and, and this language on the basis of sex really helps us today because that language has been very recently interpreted by the Supreme Court to include gender identity and sexual orientation. And so when we get the ERA in the constitution, trans people are going to be protected, constitutionally protected. Uh, we'll have permanent protection in the US constitution. Uh, people uh, of all, you know, all sexual orientations will also be included. And so it's important to know the past and know who's brought us to where we are today to also know where the future is going and, and that we are insistent and relentless in demanding that the ERA be queer. Yeah, I love that. And and I really appreciate you bringing up for the policy nerd in me, uh, the, the recent ruling in Bostock in, in 2020 that led to uh, sex being, you know, interpreted by the Supreme Court to mean sexual orientation and gender identity as well. Um, I think that's a critical component of the conversation around the Equal Rights Amendment um, because it does afford so much progress to so many people, um, you know, and and it can't it can't be lost on us um, that that is a, to your point a critical component. Knowing who's brought the movement forward um, throughout, you know, our nation's history. So I appreciate you centering. The voices and stories of queer people. Um, I am le already learning so much about people, especially in the suffrage movement. Um, and I look they're forward. Okay. <laughs> they're all well. You know, it is what it is. Um, we're everywhere. Sorry about it. We're um, everywhere. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> yeah. I so I, I think you know one of the things that's sort of on my mind is that the current state of things. Um, and I know you've talked a bit about why it's important to center us historically and what happened, but I wonder if you have thoughts based on um, sort of the, the political climate today, the, the anti-LGBTQ animus that we're seeing across the country. I'm here in Florida um, and I, I know I see everyone with the Bugs Bunny meme sawing us off, sending us into the ocean, but the truth is it's everywhere. Um, and so I wonder if you can talk about with that landscape, um, why are the queer stories so important in this conversation? And how do we, as consumers of the book and also, you know, then storytellers to go out and talk about it, um, how do we keep those stories alive in the way we talk about it? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think it's so, <laughs> I just want to note what you said, that it's everywhere, um, because people like to really demonize places where it's the hardest to fight. Um, and, and people are fighting in those places. <laughs> so, so people shouldn't give up on us. Uh, we're doing the hardest work uh, in some of the most difficult places, but, but uh, queer antagonism and misogyny are everywhere. Yeah. And, you know, I always say, I'm like, tell me where this patriarchy free island is. <laughs> Send me there. <laughs> there, I will move there and I will never think about this again. Uh, you know, like I'll buy the first ticket to that place. That place doesn't exist. No. <laughs> uh, and, and so I think it's, it's, it's easier for people to think that they live in an island, uh, but they don't. Uh, and especially in the United States of America, this is a problem, um, and we're not the exception to the rule. 85% of countries have a gender provision in their constitutions, and we don't. 
Mm. So if we're the exception, we're the exception to the worst possible degree. We're setting the worst example. Um, we do not have something that every modern democracy has, uh, which is a gender provision in their constitution. So I think, um, you know, one of the easiest examples I can give is the Equality Act. You know, a lot of people are in our community are very jazzed about the Equality Act, as they should be, uh, which passed in the House and has not passed in the Senate. Um, but why do we need both? I think it's important to understand why we need both. The Equality Act is a piece of legislation. And as we have seen recently, <laughs> legislation can be repealed. It can pass one year and then the next year be repealed or seriously cut back. Um, the same is true of jurisprudence. Uh, you know, as we can see in the reproductive rights movement, we, what, what we thought we had, which was the constitutional right to abortion access, is all but dead uh, in the majority of states and will be dead. Roe will be completely overturned in June of this year. So it's most likely that it will be completely gutted or overturned this year. Um, and so something that we took for granted that we thought our, you know, the, our foremothers in the 1970s won for us and we would never see disappear is now disappearing. And so I think it's important. Uh, that's the reason the Equal Rights Amendment is so important is, is it it's permanent. Once we change the constitution, it cannot be altered. It cannot be taken back. Um, the only way to get rid of a constitutional amendment is another constitutional amendment, mm -hmm. <laughs> which happened with prohibition, uh, but is extremely difficult to do. Yeah, as uh, know, based on... Uh, it's on the process of the Equal Rights Amendment. We know how difficult it is to get something done. These hundred years, if they've taught us anything, they have taught us it's very, very difficult to do. So, so the Equality Act is important, but it is not permanent. Mm. Um, it is not expansive. It does not provide a permanent tool for generations. Um, you know, a lot of people are worried about who's gonna, who's on the Supreme Court currently, rightfully so. Uh, but the Equal Rights Amendment will outlive every person currently on the Supreme Court. It will outlive every person alive today. Uh, it will be here in 100 years. It will be here in 500 years. It's a permanent amendment to the Constitution. So not only does it provide relief for problems we face today in the courts and in Congress, it also provides a tool for, you know, when the ERA was written in 1923, they didn't imagine the, the, the complex gender issues that we face today. And we can't imagine what it's going to be like in another hundred years. We don't know what problems um, they'll face or, or, or progress they'll make. And so this is a tool also for the future uh, for them, them to use to make it a better country, to make it, you know, um, I think it was Barbara Jordan. She says in, she said in a speech about the ERA, I want America uh, to live up to her promise. Mm. Uh, and so I think that's what we're doing right now is we're securing a more equal future. Yeah, which is the most important work, right? Uh, it's it's certainly the work that I try to do every single day. And I, I appreciate you putting it into perspective alongside legislation as well, because, you know, I think we as a democratic society can get laser focused on legislation. We can see it as sort of the only path. It's sort of the same thing. I don't know if people have seen the meme, but it's like, there's an asteroid hurtling toward earth and someone asks, what would you, what would you do? And someone else says, tell people around me to vote. Like voting is important. It's one part of the process. Uh, everybody should exercise their right to vote in this country, right? It's been hard fought for and, and hard won. Um, the, the problem is that we get so singularly focused on these like individual, like democratic levers, instead of looking at the whole picture and saying, how do we put safeguards in place um, at every level, right? And that includes legislation, but it also includes, as you said, amending the constitution to protect people's basic human rights. Um, that, that that should be the function of the US constitution, right? Is, is to ensure that our basic rights are protected. I didn't mean to interrupt you, um, oh. but I think also it's so, <laughs> when you think about the right, like they're evil geniuses, you know what I mean? Like they're planning like 
not for today and not for tomorrow, but they're planning like 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road. They have a plan, they implement it relentlessly and it's they're, it's bearing fruit. Um, and so like, what is our long-term plan? Mm -hmm. We can't just constantly be responding to the asteroid. Right. <laughs> um, you know, we can't just constantly be putting out these fires. We have to have a long-term vision and a long-term plan. Yeah. And so, I mean, not every long-term plan has to be a hundred years in the making, uh, but we never got there. We, we never got there um, in the 1970s. And so I consider this to be like unfinished work of the feminist, the earlier waves of feminism and the LGBTQ um, rights movement. And so I, I just think about like, what would they do if they were like one signature away from changing the constitution? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like you would be like, five alarm fire, like they would pull out all the stops. No one would talk about anything else. They would spend like billions of dollars. Like we are for all intents and purposes, one signature away from amending the U S constitution to include gender. And what's, you know, what's our response? I just, I just always think about like, what would they be doing if this was the case for them? And they would be like, freaking out <laughs> yeah. and so i think we need to meet it with that same level of energy <laughs> yeah and i i think you know to your point it's like not only are are we so close to achieving an incredibly monumental piece of progress um, but it is also you know we're sort of at a crossroads in our democracy where if we don't with urgency uh, put things on the table that we've been fighting for proactively, we're going to spend the rest of, you know, what little time we have with democracy uh, trying to fight against, you know, authoritarianism um, and fascism, which is creeping uh, all over the country. And so I, I do think, you know, part of the strategy here that you're talking about that's so important is what vision are we creating for what else is possible, right? Are we just responding to this stuff all the time? Um, does it, you know, feel like we're, we're dousing these little blazes that pop up everywhere? Or, or have we created a vision for what's possible? You know, we're one signature away from, from solving a lot of these things that are, you know, that are hindering our progress right now. So I appreciate that you're, you're sort of, you know, bringing that urgency to the forefront. And my, my question, I guess, then is, so, if people read the book and they they you know glean these stories, they walk away fired up. What do you hope they do next with that information? Yeah, so glad you asked. <laughs> um, I at the end of the book, so um, you know, the end of the book is the modern day. So it goes from before the Constitution until now, and the final chapter is about a state senator named uh, Pat Spearman. She's a black lesbian preacher and senator in Nevada. And she's the one who really resurrected the ERA uh, in the modern era. So she got it ratified in Nevada in 2017. Uh, then it was ratified in Illinois in 2018 and, and then in Virginia in 2020. So the last state needed was in 2020. And um, I, 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 I don't really have a conclusion for the book because the conclusion is, and the next step is you. <laughs> so like, here are all these people that have fought for it all along and, and it's still not done. So, so the next chapter of the book is you and us. Um, and so I have like, a, a, as, as all the uh, chapters go, oh, I, I, know, I know it's reversed right now, but um, there's a flow chart of what you can do. Um, and, and really I, I encourage people to talk about it. I encourage, you know, like one of the problems with the modern fight for the ERA is no one knows about it. <laughs> Like I'm obsessed and everyone I know knows about it because it's all I tweet about. Um, but, you know, the if you're born after 1982, when the original fight for the ERA, you know, lapsed, uh, you, it's not your fault that you don't know about it. It's not in the public conversation. And so I, I encourage people to learn about it. Um, I also have a podcast. They can listen to the podcast. Um, and then there are several groups. Um, one of the ones I recommend it for younger people is called Generation Ratify. It was started by two 15 year old girls um, who can't even vote yet, but are obsessed with constitutional equality. And yet they love young people. <laughs> so much hope. Um, oh God. I know, I'm like, can we just give everything to teenagers and let them take over? <laughs> um, 
And so Generation Ratify has chapters, I think it's in 34 states. Uh, they only started a few years ago, but they're this incredibly um, enthusiastic young group. There's a group called ERA Coalition. There's another group called Vote Equality. Um, these are all listed in the book, but I encourage people to join in, learn more, talk about it. Just like bring it up in conversation. You know, if you go to a town hall, ask your elected officials how they feel about in the ERA, even the local. Um, you know, in California, they're considering a measure in the Senate right now to affirm the ERA as the 28th Amendment and, mm -hmm. and affirm their ratification. And that's happening. That just happened last week. Um, so in the, even in the state legislatures, uh, folks can folks can get involved. Of course, Florida has not yet ratified the ERA. Um, yeah. And so, they'll count on us to be next, but we can get there. I promise we can get there. Um, yeah. But I think it's important to fight for it. You know what I mean? Like I'm from Utah and like, it'll be a cold day in hell when Utah ratifies the ERA. Uh, no offense uh, to the Beehive State, but it's still important to fight for it. I wrote the resolution in 2017 and it's been introduced every legislative session since. It's like a little, like it didn't get out of committee, then it got out of committee, and like you know, it, it eventually it takes a long, long time. It's been a hundred years, yeah. um, and so it's important to fight for it, even if it never happens. And I'll tell you why. Um, Utah is a good example. In Utah, again, no, we're gonna pass. It's a super, 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 super majority. Like re Mormon Republicans control the entire state, um, and uh, I think it's it's just really important um, to to advocate, even in like a what I like to call low infrastructure state. Um, and the reason it's important to advocate in Utah, there are only four Republicans, four total, uh, who voted in the US House of Representatives uh, to uh, eliminate the deadline. So um, the uh, one of the people who voted for the deadline elimination bill in Congress, one of the Republicans was from Utah of four. Um, and so all of this work, all of this advocacy, all of these bills for a bill that will never pass has built such a movement for the ERA and popular support for it in the state that one of the only representative Republican representatives who voted for it in the House is from Utah. Wow. And so it does have an effect, even if, again, we live in very difficult states uh, for women's rights and with very little human rights infrastructure. So I think, um, again, I'm from, I'm from arguably the worst state for women in the United States by almost every measurable category. We have the largest wage gap. We have the lowest participation in politics for women. We have some of the worst rates of violence against women. I mean, in every measurable category, Utah is the worst state for women. Um, and of course, also for queer people. Um, but in those places, fighting for your rights and dignity is how you find grace. It's mm -hmm. how you make change. It's how you inspire others. And so I do think it's important to do it even in those places, even if you're like, okay, we're realistic and we know it's never actually going to pass right. um, because you never know what actually will come from it. Yeah, I mean, that's, first of all, thank you. That's super inspirational. And maybe what I really needed to hear today, uh, as Florida legislature went into a special session to do a lot of horrible things that are, yeah, mind blowing. Um, but I think you're right. My boss is, uh, she's been a member of, you know, the, the LGBTQ civil rights movement for decades. Um, she helped to lead the 1993 March on Washington. She met with President Clinton in the Oval Office. Um, you know, so she's been really at the core, of course, not surprising, a black lesbian woman who's super powerful and uh, and inspirational as well. Um, and one of the things that she says all the time is, you know, some of the greatest progress we've ever made have been at the points of intense pressure. Um, when we are, you know, when we're under the thumb, when we are facing uh, incredible headwinds, that's when we've been able to innovate and create it's unfortunate we shouldn't have to do that. Um, but I do feel like we're, again, we're at one of those moments where um, there's a lot of, of headwind. There's a lot of forces that are trying to pull back on progress that we've made over the last 10, 15, 20 years and beyond. Um, and 
you know, our choices, we can either rise to that challenge or we can shrink back from it. And I know, you know, just in the last few weeks, I've seen when we rise, when we demand more, when we use our voices, when we get engaged, we inspire other people to do the same thing. Um, there are, you know, two 15 year old girls who are starting organizations to try to mobilize people. There are queer teenagers in the state of Florida leading walkouts from their schools to challenge bigoted policy. So um, to your point, it's it's our responsibility to, you know, to take the mantle on, to learn the important stories, um, to center the right voices and perspectives, and then to challenge the status quo, even in places where it seems like a futile effort. Um, we have to do that work because other people are counting on us and you never know the progress you can make. I'm reminded um, before I, I see there are some questions that are starting to pop up, um, but I'm reminded of all of the progress we've made along the way and the ways in which we've made it. Um, it's very rare that progress, substantive progress has been made over like a letter or a word on a page of a policy. And it's almost always grounded in people telling their stories. You know, I think about uh, the fight for marriage equality and, and how that was rooted in people holding hands and saying love is love. Um, the fight for, you know, non-discrimination protections and the Bostock ruling was transgender women who just wanted to go to work and be treated with dignity and respect. And the same is true as we continue to fight for you know, equality around gender and sex in this country, um, that it's about telling the stories of who people are um, in a way that reminds us that all of these issues are human rights issues. They're not just words on a page. They're not just legalese. They are about people. They're about human rights. Uh, and every one of us wants to live in a country that respects and values that. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> I have faith. I mean, I live in a beautiful community and I have faith in them. I have faith that when they see me, they want, you know, they want me to be treated with dignity and respect and that they would want the same for you too. And I think, you know, we have to fight for our own dignity, even if no one wants it. You know what I mean? Like when you talk about trans women who are fighting for just the right to work or, you know, people who wanted to, same sex couples who wanted to marry or, you know, all these different things, they, they fought even if no one was on their side, yeah. um, even if no one was with them. Um, and I think the beauty of that is then you find other people, you feel so isolated you feel so alone. You feel like, oh my God, I'm the only one who feels like this. I'm the only one in my school. I'm the only one in my state. And then the momentum builds and you connect with other people and you learn about history and you um, you find beauty and, and community in, in asserting your own dignity. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thanks for <laughs> Um, for writing a really important book and for leading a conversation around something that I think we can all get in inspired by, right? Get activated around. Uh, it does feel like we're fighting a lot of, this is who we don't want to be. Uh, and it, it feels good to have a conversation about who we want to be. Um, so with that, I, I do wanna take some time to answer questions. If you're watching and you have a question, there's a little button on the bottom where you can type in your question. Um, I'd love to, to pose it to Kate and, and get all of your questions answered. Um, there's also a button I'm going to remind folks at the bottom to buy the book. That's why we're here. Please purchase Ordinary Equality. Um, beautiful illustrations, flow chart in the back that gets you uh, mobilized around, you know, helping to, to get the ERA over the finish line. Um, so first question coming up is from Andrew. And the question, it's a two-parter, so bear with me. The first part is, what was the best part of writing this book? And then the second part is, was there anything you struggled with? Yeah, Andrew, thank you so much for your question and for attending tonight. Um, I'm a, This is the first book I've ever written. And the process of publishing is such a different process than I've ever been involved with before. Um, I knew I wanted to, I had like a very specific vision of what I wanted the book to be. And I, at first I put, I pitched it to some of the big five publishers and had some meetings and yada, yada, um, with like 
fancy publishers in New York. And they wanted it to be like 300 pages and lots of footnotes and like no illustrations and, you know, kind of more an academic text. And I was like, I am not, that's not who I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not who I am and not who I'm intending to reach. Um, and there are already books like that. And so, you know, if someone wants to read about the legal history of the ERA, they can read a law review article or they can, you know, do these different things. And so I'm like, that is not what I want out of, that's, that's not what I want for my one wild and precious life. Okay. Um, and so I kept, I think one of the part of the struggle um, was fighting for this vision that I had of like fully illustrated, full color, like hardback. It's, it's an expensive book to print yeah. um, and, and it's heavily designed. And like, that's also annoying for printing apparently. Um, and so, you know, I was asking a publisher to print a very expensive uh, and like pretty complicated book. Um, and so I think I, I eventually landed at a very small press, um, Gibb Smith, which is an incredible, you know, they, they saw the vision completely through like better than I ever imagined. Um, it's just, it's, it's also like a huge book. <laughs> it's like very hearty and hefty, um, more like a coffee table book. And so it's not just something that can like disappear. You know what I mean? Like I wanted it to be present. I wanted it to shout. Um, and, and that it, it's like a, a book in the form of a shout and that's how it came out. But it took a long time of me advocating and like sticking to that vision and not saying like, oh, okay, I'll write an academic book about it. You know what I mean? Um, and so I think that was the struggle um, was getting someone to buy into this vision of what it was going to be and find the illustrator is actually a friend of mine, um, uh, another Mormon lesbian uh, and ex-Mormon lesbian. And so her name is Nicole LaRue and she really captured the vision of the book and, and is just a truly, truly gorgeous illustrator. Um, and so that was, that was a struggle to get the actual vision for, like you said, you know, you had a title in mind and you're like, I want it to be this. It's very hard to like keep your vision intact, um, because they want something that will sell yeah, <laughs> and so melding those two is difficult, but, um, I'm so grateful that, that Gibb Smith saw the vision, um, and it's not even out uh, for like, it's the public, the pub date is actually April 26th due to like, uh, lots of delays, COVID delays. Uh, but it's already on the third printing even before the pub date. So I think like I stuck to my vision, but I also made something that people want to read, <laughs> um, and want to buy, um, which is very exciting. And I, I would say the best part about the process was, you know, I'm like, I consider myself to be like somewhat of a history nerd, you know, especially in this lane of like, you know, legal equality and women's rights and suffrage. And, and there were so many things I didn't know. Like in doing the research, I'm like, what? Like she did what? She said <laughs> what? Like, you know, like, <laughs> who? <laughs> like who? Like what? How did I not know this? Um, and so I think like discovering a lot of characters and stories that I'd never heard of um, was so satisfying. And so just like also enraging. <laughs> it's like this person is so important to US history. How do we not know who they are? Um, Polly Murray is an example of that. Polly Murray is um, a transgender pioneer, legal savant, um, you know, lawyer, first woman ordained Episcopal priest, like just, just incredible life. Um, Polly Murray is the one who thought of the theory behind what Ruth Bader Ginsburg used in the 1970s to litigate women into the constitution. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was Polly Murray's idea. And, and Ruth Bader Ginsburg actually credited Polly on the brief, on her first brief to the Supreme court, even though Polly didn't write it, she credited Polly with this theory. So how do I not know about this person? You know what I mean? Like, how do we not all know? How, why isn't she on a stamp? Why isn't, you know, all these different things. Um, and so I think that was the best part was like discovering these incredibly 
I, I won't even say hidden, I'll say like intentionally erased people and history. And, and again, like everyone cool is queer from history, the end, like, I, like every, I'm like, what? She was a lesbian? What? She was a lesbian? Like everyone, you know what I mean? Like Adelina uh, Otero Warren, who was this incredible suffragist from New Mexico, um, first one of the first women to run for Congress, didn't win, lost to a man, but like came very close, um, was a superintendent of New Mexico school systems, was a suffragist who translated everything into Spanish in, in, in you know, the 19 teens. Uh, she's like, no, like this movement, she wouldn't have said intersectional at the time, but like this movement has to be intersectional. We have to put all suffrage materials into Spanish. She gave yeah. speeches in Spanish. Like this woman was a lesbian and had a partner and homesteaded a ranch that they called Las Dos. Like these women lived like openly as lesbians in the 1920s. And like, how did I not know about her? You know what I mean? So I think like discovering these characters and bringing them to life was the best part. The best part and I, honestly I, I think that's what I'm most excited about uh when I when I finally get my copy and I'm able to read it is I you know without a, this is all about you and I don't want to <laughs> pull focus but um as a as a queer person you know I know what it felt like to be young and not see myself represented in anything that we learned about there were no queer people in history uh, that we were taught about. There were no queer people in like books or movies or classroom materials. That's a, you know, an ongoing conversation in Florida and beyond right now is whether or not to put queer people in those spaces. Um, but what I'm, I'm, what I'm most excited about, I think is what you've just said is the best part, which is discovering those stories, uh, learning more about how I fit into the fabric of our country, learning more about where you know, my siblings fit, whether they be, you know, the powerful black lesbian woman who's my boss uh, or my fabulous trans siblings, where they all fit in the fabric of the foundation of our country. Queer people have always been here. We're always going to be here. Um, you can't put that genie back in the bottle. So sorry to all those politicians who think you might be able to, but um, that's what I'm most excited about is to, to really understand where we fit in the beautiful tapestry that is this country. Um, and I hope that that inspires me to, to go on and share those stories and talk about where we fit in the future as well. Um, yeah. So we're coming up, I know we've said 45 minutes, um, we're coming up to a close here, but I did wanna pass it back to you, Kate. First of all, everyone, the green button, it is shimmering at the bottom. Please pick up a copy of Ordinary Equality. Um, you already know how powerful and inspiring it's gonna be. Um, but Kate, I wanted to, to give you the last word. Is there anything you want people to, to know or keep in mind as, as we round things out tonight? Um, I'm just, I'm grateful for you pointing out that the ERA is also about men um, and that you want to find your place in, in this history and in this movement. Because as I said, the word women is not in the, in the ERA. So the ERA also protects men from gender discrimination. The ERA protects gay men um, from gender discrimination. And so I think, um, you know, not everything's about men, uh, but in this I'm case- that. I'm good with that. <laughs> but in this case, uh, it's, it's actually vitally important for the movement um, to understand that the ERA is for everyone. The ERA is, is for everyone who dis experiences gender discrimination. And it's, it's just really, really important for men uh, to embrace that, to talk about that, um, and to see themselves reflected in the movement. Um, and it's, it's, it's fact. It's, it's no exaggeration to say uh, that men are also included and protected. And so I think that's, that's a really, really important point, and I'm glad you, you ended on that. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, I think telling our stories and telling these these histories um, has a really real impact on the way that kids not not in the way they're <laughs> demonizing in Florida, uh, but you know I had two my two nine year old nieces um, over this weekend and they are you know one is lives in Maryland and one lives in Utah uh, raised young girls being raised Mormon and having examples in popular media and in their immediate circles being queer is just like normal yeah. like 
we we told them we didn't even tell them we don't even tell them anything but they asked how we met my partner and I and we told them and then the, the immediate next thing she said was well, I want to tell you how my mom and dad met and fell in love. And then she just went into telling this other story and it was, they didn't even have any follow-up questions. You know what I mean? Like they weren't like, what does it mean for two girls to be in love? Like, did it, you know, like it doesn't even, it doesn't phase them at all. <laughs> it seems totally normal. And I was very prepared to like answer questions and like, does it, you know what I mean? Like get on my soapbox. Um, <laughs> And they, they were just like, okay, cool. Let me tell you about another love story. Um, and so I think that is the power of the storytelling that we're doing. We, no matter what the opposition says, like we are winning this long-term battle. And, and, and by telling our truths and telling our stories and, and reclaiming this history, um, we are normalizing our existence and our rights in a way that cannot be undone. That's right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and you're helping to lead that charge. So um, I, I want to thank you. I feel already, I haven't even got my copy yet, but I feel already prepared to be a better accomplice to the movement. I say accomplice, not ally, because allies are there in the good times and accomplices are the ones who go to jail with you when necessary. So count me in as an accomplice to get equality over the finish line. Um, and with that, I want to thank everyone who's tuned in tonight. Thank you so much again. Please pick up your copy and I'll turn it back to our friends at Books and Books. Oh, tech, technical difficulties. <laughs> we're just, we're, re we're reading lips, but that's okay. <laughs> I will just say, um, I'm not sure if you're unable to mute, but I will say, please support independent bookstores. Books and Books has been so incredibly supportive um, for doing this uh, event, for supporting uh, authors of, you know, small authors uh, from small presses. And it's incredibly important to support independent bookstores. If you can buy it in person, buy it in person. If you, you can also buy it in, online um, uh, from Books and Books. So make sure to get your copy from Books and Books. Yes, please. Please support independently owned bookstores. Please support Kate. Get your copy of Ordinary Equality. And I just want to thank everyone again for joining us tonight. Thank you. <laughs>